Team building and team performance, a serious topic, but how fun to develop. I am Patrick Magier, and today my guest is Hank Reinhoff, former coach of some of the best athletes of the world and expert in anything to do with high performance. Okay, good. <clears throat> good morning, Hank. Uh, pleasure to see you here for all those who don't know you. Just a little introduction. You are a very famous coach in track and field. You have also helped speed skaters, Mary Pierce in tennis. You work with elite forces in, in the army. So I think um, actually you're one of the persons I learned most for in my life. So very thankful for that. And I'm sure that sharing your insights and, and experiences will be very fruitful for everybody. Okay, and, thank you, Pat. And I'll jump right into the, the subject. You have okay. trained many, many women to top level. People like Merle Naughty, Sandra Farman, Patrick, legends in, in track and field. Um, world champions, Olympic champions, record holders, and so on. And many of these athletes were women. You have also trained men. But what is easier to train, men or women? <laughs> mm, that's a good question. I think men are kind of easier, kind of easier. Men are different, uh, different. Well, different animals, you can say. Um, men t uh, tend to have bad memories. Men tend to be less emotionally involved in things, or they keep it uh, to themselves more. That's uh, another one. Women are more, um, yeah, complex. What a surprise. <laughs> but you only say that because you are a man. So if you were women, it would <laughs> yeah, probably exactly, be the exactly. other way around. If I was a woman, I would say men are complex, women are easy. That's true. No, but, women are uh, to train. Number one, physically, there's a clearly a difference between men and, uh, and uh, women. But mentally, the, that, the difference is, might be even larger. Women have a, a higher drive to reach their goals. They are kind of ruthless, always towards themselves. Uh, they go beyond. They're very loyal, to, for instance, to their coaches, to, or to in their relationship. They stay even if they should have left. Uh, that's a thing that is easy to manipulate as a coach, for instance. Uh, I never do this, but it, it, it is kind of easy, you know, this kind of wrong kind of loyalty towards your coach, uh, for instance, or towards your company. Women are used to, to handle more pain. Women come up with creative solutions. Uh, women are more uh, harmonic, as a matter of fact, striving towards harmony, while men is more into a conflict model most of the time. That's why they excel in sports, but it's also physical. That's why they cause wars. Uh, that's why they thrive in business, because they are used to this conflict model, where women are, from a biological point of view, so, more... So, in other, in other words, the business world actually is more made for competitive fighting men than for team-working women, question mark? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I think... I have read some interesting books and talked to some interesting people about uh, the hormonal influences of, for instance, the, the, the main competitive hormone is testosterone. Testosterone, right, what, which creates aggression, higher level of aggression in men and in women. Just men have a 10 times higher level of testosterone. Um, the women that, uh, that want to compete in this uh, competitive uh, field in a conflict model have to have, in order to succeed, have to have higher levels of testosterone and therefore lose some of the female edge, as a matter of fact. They are tougher and they, they consider to have a more uh, of a male attitude. Ruthless, but not ruthless to themselves, ruthless to others uh, uh, mainly. And that, that's kind of what that, that, that uh, puts off most men, because they feel they're a competitive woman, a woman that is hard, that is strong, that is, is not appreciated uh, most of the time. But, um, Hank, you, you also worked with elite soldiers, huh? with special yeah. forces. Yeah. Um, my opinion, this is probably the toughest guy you can find. 
but their team behavior is very different from team behavior that you normally find in a military hierarchy, right? Yes, in the normal military, for draft, for instance, you have a clearly a hierarchy according to the rank of the of the of the of the soldier. Um, in special forces, they are trained to let this go because there are circumstances in which they operate uh, is in small, very small groups, three, four, five, and sometimes eight to ten men, so not in large groups. Um, all by themselves, left to their own devices, and with no connection to the commander. As a matter of fact, the commander isn't in the field, the commander is somewhere else, and he cannot judge that situation. So they have to judge the situation uh, themselves and make a decision based on their own, and not on only uh, the, what the commander is telling them. They, they, they leave this. So that's interesting. They have to be more independent, more uh, responsible, than the normal uh, military. They learn to operate even by themselves uh, in groups of two and even by themselves if they're alone. But they they also have this attitude which is kind of, how shall I express that? Um, the, the, over the rank, the knowledge of a topic always prevails. So the person with the most experience is the one we take the decision, let's say, Somebody, somebody needs to run a machine, it's the guy that, that has the most experience with cars or whatever that will do that, and not just a more junior person or a more senior person just because of the rank. Yeah, this is a kind of a philosophical uh, uh, topic. We assume that the guy in charge, the leader, as a matter of fact, has more experience, more knowledge, and takes better decisions than the people on the floor, on the, on, on, on the work floor, or the people in the field like this. And, and this, of course, isn't the case. That the commander is sitting somewhere far away, maybe looking at the screen, has some microphone, but doesn't really can judge the complete holistic situation, uh, actual situation in the field. So his decisions are based on strategy, not on tactical or operational uh, uh, factors. He doesn't have a clue what's going on there. He just hears somebody talking to him, but the real situation escapes him. So that's why he can be overruled. And it happens uh, quite a few times that his decision is overruled by the people in the field, which is, of course, an excellent idea, as a matter of fact. So if, if, we, if we go back to this, standard topic of diversity, men versus women. Mm -hmm. um, is there any reason except just the physical strengths that would make women less suitable for special forces? Or on the contrary, would you believe that many of them would actually be very good in, in such a job if it wasn't for the physical difference? Well, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 very good in, in doing this job. It's just that carrying the weight of 30 kilograms in a backpack for a 65 kilogram woman is something else than for a 90 kilogram man. And the, 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 the carrying of the weapons and the ammunition and so on, and the climbing of a wall of two meters is different from a one meter 65 uh, woman than for a two meter tall man. So this is the physical one. But I think basically women, when it comes to fighting, to defending uh, themselves, their families are, of course, tougher than men. Uh, in the Israeli army, in the special forces, the women are feared, as a matter of fact. And there's the saying under anti-terrorist forces, shoot the women first. If there's a terrorist group, a woman, shoot the women first. Because they, they are... Hank, we, we both come out of the world of sports originally. Yeah. Um, we notice that there's very few leaders in the world of sport that are female. Actually, it is still a elderly, white, dominated field. Uh, yeah. Of course, by men. Yeah. yeah. Would would it be necessary to change the preconditions under which people are selected and which make the decisions, or? Is it just to educate the women to be more fighting, etc.? What, what's your opinion on that? I think um, well, women can be excellent leaders without being very competitive and very aggressive. The way to the top to get there, they have to fight. But once they're at the top, 
they can they can can be excellent leaders. I believe that more women should be in there. If, if at least they have the qualities for it, always look at the intrinsic qualities of a person, not only if they're black or white or tall or small or man or women, look at the qualities, if they're the same same uh, qualities. The selection is, of course, based on, uh, on male dominance. So we look for strong people. Well, if you look for strong people, you look for a man, not for a woman, if it's about physical strength, for instance. So the selection criteria are based on uh, male criteria, not female criteria. If it's about communication, women are much better communicators, as a matter of fact. Um, that brings, brings us basically to, as you know, one of my favorite topics, what I call diversity 2.0. So um, yeah. I always pledge it's not so much about is it the man or woman. Does the person have the right competences, the right qualities for yes. a, a certain job? So. We should start this diversity discussion already at the level of the personality. What's your opinion on that? Yes, absolutely true. What you see in in, uh, in uh, society right now, there's a there's a artificial attempt to increase diversity by putting a percentage of women in there. There have to be women in there. So that does harm to the real uh, cause of diversity because that's not what diversity is all about. If you put women there. It basically means, well, we put a, women, uh, a woman in there, uh, she's not very good, but, you know, we had to do it. Uh, they have to have the 50% uh, quota, uh, quota in, uh, for women. So that is really harm to the, to the, to the case. And it, it becomes an alibi for uh, just putting in women which don't have the, the competences. And that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for men or women or anything. That, that or anyone that has the competences, that, that's first and foremost. Otherwise, diversity is going to fail. But are we ready for that yet? I, I remember both of us were already in the early 90s in South Africa doing training camps. We have, we have yeah. seen and lived the, the upper tide. If there hadn't been a, a drastic, even revolutionary change, we wouldn't have seen that. So my query is always, can we, can we get rid of a quota without changing the preconditions? Because if we apply the quota and we still are looking for the strong, competitive, uh, aggressive person, um, mm. is that going to work? I have my doubts on that. No, it, 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 it's, uh, it's absolutely true. No, nothing changed because it's, uh, it's apart from... Uh, from uh, uh, the physical factor and the, and the biological factor. There's also a culture, a very strong cultural uh, uh, factor, and it's a little bit rude to say, but John Lennon said, the woman is the nigger of the world. You can't say both words anymore these days, but it, it, it's true. She, uh, uh, in most countries and, and in our culture, she's still rated a, a second-ranking citizen, as a matter of fact. You can see it in, in, in all facts. If, it, if in sports you can see uh, the salaries of professional soccer players in women or in men. If you look at any factor in, in tennis or women are second rated uh, still. And of course, we men dominate. It has been you know, like this through ages. There are more witches burned than magicians are burned uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, why would it? Most of our effort is, uh, uh, as men is uh, spent on, on, on suppressing uh, the power of women, as a matter of fact. It's just, just a social truth. Which is hard to swallow, of course. Hank, we are almost at the end of our podcast now, but we can't let stand act like this. So I'll do a, just a tiny little break, and then we'll take up a second podcast because we need to dwell on that. Um, yeah. So okay. we say goodbye for now, and we'll be back very soon. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for listening to our Mission Team podcast. Do not forget to register for the next episode and visit us on mission-team.com.